Hello, everyone. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Sanjot Mahendale, and I would like to welcome you to um, this three-day program combining two of our annual events, the Tang Lecture and the Tang Conference in Silk Road Studies, respectively. I want to give a special welcome to all of our participants, uh, some of whom have traveled from afar, some of whom had very challenging journeys but were able to make it uh, in time. So welcome to UC. Um, for those who don't know our program very well, I just want to talk a little bit about the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies. By institutionalizing Silk Road Studies in 2017 at UC Berkeley, the PY and Kim Wei, Kim May W. Tang Center for Silk Road Studies' main aim is really to transcend long-standing boundaries that have challenged and constricted, oh wow, area studies. That's better. Thank you. Uh, thereby encouraging uh, transnational, transregional, cross-cultural, and cross-disciplinary approaches to research and understanding. Silk Road Studies at Berkeley bring to the fore the notion of mobility um, as a challenge to entrench neatly constructed academic, national, and cultural boundaries. Um, the central reality is things move, and their spatial mobility alters their meaning and use, creating new cultural horizons. Uh, and there's a continued need, I think, for an archaeology of itinerancy, where movement in itself is an object of inquiry, to replace or supplement current paradigms of the study of material culture that may not be fully adequate uh, to understand the combined artistic, geographic, and socioeconomic complexities of the ancient past. Though it too uh, is a construction that is, I think, the ultimate usefulness of the Silk Road rubric. The Tang Center's uh, programmatic activities often fan out from an annual theme, and this year the focus has been on the transfer of scientific, medical, and technological knowledge as a result of the increased level of interaction concomitant with the exchange of goods and information. And this focus raises broad, uh, fascinating questions, such as how was knowledge constructed and transferred within and between societies in pre-modern Eurasia? How was it received and transmuted along the way? What were the processes of transfer? How and where was it stored? What was its materiality? How and what did it transform? Um, for the events of the next several days, we have gathered a wonderful group of scholars from different disciplines with various area foci and no doubt varying opinions uh, to highlight and tackle some of these issues. We begin today with our keynote speaker who will discuss the new types of Buddhist books that emerged in 9th and 10th century Dunhuang. Amanda Goodman is assistant professor of Chinese Buddhism in the department for the study of religion and the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. She's a familiar face to many of you, no doubt, uh, as she has deep ties to UC Berkeley, where she received a PhD uh, from the Group in Buddhist Studies in 2013. My own affiliation with the Buddhist Studies program postdates uh, by a few years Professor Goodman's, but we are strongly connected through her work here because I currently teach the course that she created, Buddhism Along the Silk Road. Her work traces the local Chinese adaptation of early Tantric Buddhism, with particular focus on the collection of 9th and 10th century Chinese and bilingual Chinese Tibetan ritual manuals recovered from the so-called Dunhuang Library Cave. She is currently uh, completing her first book project, Chinese Tantra, Ritual, Hybridity, and the Rise of the Buddhist Local which is a study of Chinese and Tibetan Tantric Buddhist ritual works based on the Dunhuang manuscripts. She is a member of two collaborative projects on global medieval studies based at the University of Toronto. Uh, the first, Practices of uh, Commentary, a collaborative project between scholars in North America, Germany, and the UK, and the Middle East, 
and the Middle East working to document and interpret pre-modern commentarial practices. Deliverables include a forthcoming special issue of the medieval, glo medieval globe, medieval practices of commentary, uh, intellectual traditions, and their transmission, which she co-edits with uh, fellow scholars. Uh, and also a handbook of global commentary, uh, which she also edits with, uh, in particular, Valid Saleh of the University of Te uh, Toronto, but also other scholars as, as well. Um, the second project is titled Hidden Stories, New Approaches to the Local and Global History of the Book, a project of the University of Toronto, uh, Mississauga, which was new to me, uh, I apologize, um, the University of Toronto Libraries and the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. Uh, it, it's a project that is generously funded by the Mellon Foundation. And the grant's purpose is to build and support a network of scholars, curators, conservators, and scientists exploring developments in book technologies within a range of contexts, focusing particularly on occasions of cultural interchange in the pre-modern world. The project includes two Dunhuang-related um, research modules, for which she is the lead researcher. Uh, Dunhuang book formats, which will interpret the new book formats that emerged in Tibetan period Dunhuang, circa middle of the 8th and middle to the middle of the 9th centuries, and create robust uh, dating rubrics and a multilingual reference guide. Uh, the second uh, project uh, is book use at Dunhuang, which will examine the layered physical evidence of the use, storage, and recycling of books and prints using a variety of non-invasive, scientific, analytic, and imagining uh, methods to gain insights into the devotional practices across this period. Amanda's close reading of the Dunhuang manuscripts, her research on manuscript authorship, and her work on materiality and codicology, combining text and image, has been of particular interest to the Tang Center for Silk Road Studies. And she is currently among um, a group of scholars who are supporting uh, and, and um, uh, evaluating the development of, the, of a Silk Road exhibition to be uh, put in place, hopefully in 2026, at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum. Today, uh, she will discuss the connected book histories of Eastern Eurasia to reveal networks of human relationships, as well as technological and material entanglements that knit together our pre-modern world. So please help me welcome Amanda Goodman. Um, so again, thank you Sanjo for the warm introduction and for the kind invitation to give the 2023 annual Tong Lecture in Silk Road Studies. It's just incredible to see what's been built here since I did develop that course on Buddhism in the Silk Road many years ago with the support of the Tong family and I know from time spent with you Sanjo and Karen Clancy, both here and in the field, the building the center has been a labor of love and it's become an important resource for so many of us working in the various corners of Silk Road Studies, so thank you. So for better or worse, for more than two decades, I have been reading rare Chinese and to a lesser extent Tibetan Buddhist scholastic and ritual works preserved among the cache of manuscripts recovered from the so-called library cave at Dunhuang. Over these many years, I have come to understand something of the unique flavor of Dunhuang Buddhism through the manuscripts and to realize the site's true significance for thinking about what I call the Buddhist local. That is, the local forms of Buddhism that flourished along the regional and trans-regional network of Buddhist sites that were connected to, yet distant from, the elite urban-based capital B Buddhisms that are so often presented in our textbooks as Buddhism proper. And here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, is an image of Dunhuang Cave 16 and 17. And the red arrow points to the side chamber, the storage chamber that was a refurbished memorial hall for a local prominent monk, uh, where all of the Dunhuang manuscripts were found. So that side chamber is known as Cave 17, and I might refer to that in my talk. Um, 
And it seems obligatory to show this image whenever also giving a talk on Jun Huang, so there is much that could be said about what appears to be the stage nature of this photo. And this is Paul Pelio in 1908 studying manuscripts by candlelight in Cave 17. Uh, again, there's been some debate about this image, but I recently got a phone call, a very excited phone call out of the blue from Stephen Tizer, who reported that he read every word of every journal Pelio penned, and that he really did spend time with candles in the cave reading the text, so it's quite exciting. And I'll just point out here the bundles of manuscripts behind him, uh, and some even um, bound books. Uh, here on the right. Uh, as an aside here, while we're looking at these images of the manuscripts, I would note that what scholars often refer to as the Dunhuang collection is turning out to be significantly more complex and dynamic a corpus than previously thought. And my suspicion is that this is also true of the other major manuscript finds from Central Asia. Fang Guangchang, for example, one of the towering figures in Dunhuang manuscript studies, takes the Dunhuang documents, Dunhuang Wenshui, to include items from Cave 17, but also from other caves at Mogao and from other non-cave sites in Dunhuang, such as stupas. So this is a kind of um, evolving collection, it turns out, the Dunhuang collection. Now, there is, of course, a place for the study of what we might call canonical Buddhism. I'm a big fan. Uh, but not only has the list of the great books of Buddhism changed directly as a result of the Dunhuang and other old manuscript finds. For example, it is now common to read indigenous Chinese and Tibetan Buddhist scriptures alongside what are deemed to be Indian Buddhist classics. But the very fact that the field now focuses on the material books themselves, including the paper makers, book technicians, rubricators, scribes, and illustrators, together with the monastic and semi-monastic and lay practitioners who commissioned, copied, carried, read, lectured with, and annotated these books, means that the relationship between Buddhist studies and Buddhism's oldest books has changed. Indeed, over the past two or three decades, and really over the past century, as more and more scholars have joined forces to decipher sections of the Dunhuang corpus and other early manuscript finds, the narrative arc of Buddhist history has shifted to include those Buddhist places and those Buddhist traditions from the Silk Road regions because of their manuscript witnesses. What is more, these manuscript finds contain a wealth of information about Sino-Indian, Sino-Tibetan, Indo-Tibetan, I'm not sure that I love all those hyphenated terms, uh, and other cultural exchanges, and have forced the field to reflect in new ways on the complex nature of cultural encounter and exchange in the pre-modern world. Philologists, often now working at the cutting edge of codicology and paleography, have identified clusters of related manuscripts and done careful textual work to reconstruct not only the timeline of the introduction of writing and the book in Buddhist history, but also the intellectual and craft practices represented by those texts, often by literally rejoining manuscript fragments to date, identify, and assess individual book formats and the languages and scripts used to preserve texts in manuscript form. Likewise, art historians and archaeologists have explored the multiple dimensions of local Buddhist visual and material cultures and the social and imaginative worlds that promoted and sustained those cultures, including their painting, textile, and yes, book traditions. In short, the accumulation of material and the slow digestion and integration of that material over time has allowed scholars to connect certain dots and to develop an, intu an intuition about the relationship between the material aspects of the text they study and the intellectually rich human traditions they represent, and the various technical and artistic traditions they entail, full consideration of which we might call something like the art and craft of the Buddhist book, which is sort of a project I'm working on. This type of Buddhist book history and write, uh, Buddhist book history writing tracks book production techniques and considers both the ways that writing and book technologies impact Buddhist cultures, as well as the myriad ways that Buddhists over time and space exploited these new formats to, to do new things with, uh, and allows scholars to forge new research paths by formulating new research questions that emerge from digging ever deeper into the archive to make connections heretofore undetected. 
In her practice as an archaeologist of the book, Agnieszka Helmenwazny, who many of you are familiar with, uh, conceives of this project on at least two levels, she states, and I quote, at the micro level, studying individual books provides us with valuable information about a particular book and possibly its provenance. However, seen from a broader perspective, examining a range of items helps reconstruct the history of crafts connected with book, make, book making, such as paper making, ink production, and the art of scribing. Uh, furthermore, the examination of each book will allow evidence to be collected on book production from all periods and regions, and here we might insert the Silk Road regions or the Buddhist book routes, thus enhancing our understanding of the role books play in early Buddhist cultures. In other words, this kind of material research, when performed on a sufficiently representative group of books, will enable the history of the book to be written." End quote. Such an endeavor as the one Helmut Vazny is outlining places the study of early Buddhist book forms and Central Asian codicology firmly within the larger project of the global history of the book. So what is global book history? Global book history points to a methodology for studying the development and reception of book traditions that embraces rather than rejects the ever-present tension between the global and the local. As one might expect, this embracing of the tension between the global and the local comes with certain big challenges, requiring that we map out the codicological terrain and the connected artistic, scholastic, and ritual ecologies of basically all of Eurasia's past, and other continents too. Consider for a moment the vast repertoire of knowledge required to undertake such a project, and this, by the way, is one way of reading the Silk Road Project. First, one must have command over the timelines and territories of the early empires, their administrative languages and scripts, as well as basic literacy and the materials used to produce these books. In Western Eurasia, we have papyrus, parchment, and leather. In the East, wood, bamboo, silk, and paper, and sometimes leather. Uh, sometimes in what was likely the final centuries BCE, and certainly by the first century of the Common Era, these traditions met apparently in the far eastern reaches of the Achaemenid Empire, or Achaemenid Empire, uh, where imperial Aramaic scribal and manuscript cultures were appropriated by the Buddhists of Gandhara. And here I'm referencing the recent and extremely thought-provoking work of Stefan Baums and others on the Gandharan, Bamian, and Gilgit manuscript traditions. Uh, and here I would just like to say that my talk uh, on the work of dozens of, uh, is based on the work of dozens of incredible scholars working in diverse fields, not all of whom I can cite explicitly and not all of whom I, might, I may cite correctly. So that's just a little disclaimer. Uh, in addition, one might have a basic understanding of the different documentary and archival practices used locally across the regions, whether those practices were structured by socio-political or religious norms or both. It also involves an understanding of the hybrid and often highly improvisational formats and conventions that emerge when traditions meet and exchange happens. So in other words, knowing how to think and write about ideas like hybridity and alteration in a non-reductive way. Again, the scope and scale of such an undertaking is dizzying to conceive, but when it's done well, it's breathtaking. I'm an advocate of the global approach to the book, Buddhist book, but it does require us to consider the methodologies we use, and my own experience researching the Junhuang Buddhist books has required several methodological detours into medieval global history and archival studies to develop a kind of deafness of touch when working with my manuscripts. By necessity, I'd say this approach requires comparative thinking and collaboration. As historian Suzanne Akbari puts it, this is because, quote, our disciplines, as it were, discipline us, signaling what is important and what is peripheral and what concepts are thinkable and which are virtually unthinkable, establishing hierarchies and binary oppositions, introducing terminological challenges, and so on. To work across disciplines in the joint study of, say, Central Asian Codicology or Buddhist book history requires more than mere knowledge sharing. For Akbari, it entails, quote, an elaborate dance of reconciliation in which disciplinary norms are examined and, where necessary, adapted, end quote. Uh, this allows us to open up the history of the book in ways that are minimally impacted by or which explicitly consider and address the historical development of our individual fields. 
So how, for example, can we enable conversations across disciplines, languages, and cultural formations that are distantly related like those required by the history of the Buddhist book or the book on the Silk Road? Again, each region comprising the Silk Road has its own archives, particular historiographies, specific religious and cultural traditions, as well as artistic practices and material and visual cultures. Here, I say, manuscripts offer us a way in. The visual layout of the manuscript page reveals assumptions about the relative status of text and gloss. Interpretive prompts in the marginal or interlinear commentary tell us about the relationship of teacher and student. Beyond these, material evidence of use, whether lecture notes scrawled hastily in the margin or vivid rubrication to highlight key points to be memorized, illuminates the practices of modern, uh, pre-modern scholarly communities. Other marks, and I'll show you some here in a moment, reveal traces of lost ritual practices. Linking this back to Helman Wozni's approach, by exploring the development of the book in a range of specific locales, it becomes possible to gain a better sense of the wider pan, uh, patterns in the practice. So for the remaining, uh, remainder of my time then, I'm going to try to show you, instead of tell you, how I am trying to write one chapter in global book history by considering the connected, book, uh, connected Buddhist book histories of Eastern Eurasia to reveal networks of human relationships as well as the technological and material entanglements that knit together the pre-modern Buddhist world. I think Sanjo just read that line. So I will use three case studies grounded in the three new book formats that took Dunhuang's Buddhist community by storm in what appears to be the ninth century and which was responsible for the great flourishing of local hybrid formats by the 10th century, the Poti, the Concertina, and the Codex, or a thread-bound book. I will also discuss certain hybrid book formats. So an exploration of the codicological terrain of 9th and 10th century Dunhuang forces us to reach backwards into antiquity and forward into the early modern period in order to highlight the continuities and disjunctions that can be observed when we take a long view of and a geographically capacious perspective on the Buddhist book. But let me back up just for a second. The title of my talk is The Book and the Silk Roads, and while both the book and the Silk Roads are likely familiar to those gathered here this evening, I'll quickly offer up some working definitions and then turn to the manuscripts. So I'll begin with the Silk Roads. As it stands today, the Silk Road or Silk Roads refer not to a single road, but to the network of old routes that were used for historical exchange across Eurasia. These routes require us to think in different registers and scales and to consider the cross-cultural, regional, inter-regional, and long-distance exchange across Eurasia by land and sea, connecting Central Asia with China, India, the Persian world, Middle East, Rome, and Africa prior to, say, the 14th century. And I will admit that Silk Road periodizations have always made me extremely terrified. Uh, mostly because there are just so many moving parts and issues on the table to sort of get the timeline right. Okay. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to set my sights on the period that begins in the final centuries BCE and work forward, and really again stop in the 10th century, although the story of the Buddhist book, like the Tibetan book and the Chinese book and the Manichaean book and other books, traditions is only just then really getting started. That might not be true for Manichaeism. And I'm going to focus on this region here. Many of you have probably seen this map. Um, so this is the, the northern and the southern silk routes that skirt the Taklamakan Desert there in the center, which is precisely why we have such, uh, ex, uh, such materials extant, because of the dry air conditions of this region. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of... Oh. of key points. So here on the southern Silk Road, this area here, we have Khotan and Nia, two important sites. Uh, and on the Northern Silk Road there, we have Kara Shahar. I think that's how you pronounce it. There are many pronunciations for many of these sites, so forgive me. Uh, and Turfan, also known as Kocho or Gaochang. 
And then we have Dunhuang here on the eastern side of the map. And before I launch into a uh, discussion about the Dunhuang new book format, uh, and then kind of as an aside, I just want to point out how fascinating it is to consider for a moment the introduction of new book technologies um, in documentary and iconographical sources, as well as in practice. So here we see Buddhist monks from the site of Karashahar along the Northern Silk Road inscribing poti books, holding either brushes or pen, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I also don't know exactly when this painting dates, but I'm guessing it's closer to the 10th century than not. So I don't know if that's very clear, but... So you have a teacher giving a Dharma talk, or a t you know, however we want to conceptualize this, and individual students holding their poti and brush taking notes. And this is probably a very organic process that gets into some deep and heavy Mahayana Buddhism conversations about how and when and where Buddhists first started writing down their texts and what the context was. So it's very fun to see an image where everyone is sitting before a teacher with their own potis and the teacher is reading from his own separate copy of some text. Indeed, it's wonderful uh, what scenes like this show us about what early Buddhist books look like and how they were used. So there is some documentary and iconographical evidence, again, uh, when we ask these questions. What do Buddhist books look like? How did they use them? Well, we have some traces here. And this brings me to my second definition of the book. So here are some ideas to get us started. The book is a physical artifact spanning two major forms, the scroll and the codex. The book is a portable medium fashioned from a variety of materials and found in various formats for the express purpose of writing, storing, and or short sharing information, textual or visual. Manuscript books, like printed books, consist of pages that are either glued or sewn together along one or both sides of the page. Books are often bound by covers made from a variety of materials, again, wood, textiles, or reinforced paper. Books record text using conventional writing systems linked to local or translocal languages, or in multiple languages and scripts, and or visual elements arranged in specific layouts. The textual arrangement of individual works, which is different than mise en page, uh, like the form or format of books, can provide tantalizing clues about the history of use of the book as a social object. So before jumping ahead to the new book formats of Dunhuang, let me just say a couple more words about the earliest book forms we have, namely scrolls. Early Buddhist scrolls typically consist of pages glued or sewn together, or sometimes both, depending on the format. Here is an image from Gandhara, what appears to be a debate scene. Uh, and we can see um, birch bark scrolls held in the hands of two of the debaters. Uh, and what's really fun here is that you can see threading that was used to bind together the birch bark sheets that had ostensibly been glued together, sort of a double bind. Okay. So even these small uh, details are captured in the uh, archaeological record. And here, in fact, is an example of, <laughs> I didn't delete my note that says, why this is so significant, because it's so early. Um, and why this birch bark scroll from Gandhara, like all the Gandharan scrolls, is so interesting is not only because they represent the earliest extant Buddhist books that we have, but that they likely date from the earliest period in which any Buddhists anywhere were writing. So this is an extremely interesting sample. Uh, and the fact that its format and its material condition lines up with, again, the archaeological record is quite exciting. In China, we also see scrolls very early on, but they were fashioned from wood or bamboo strips and fastened with strings. So this is a tradition that predates and apparently is separate from the Western uh, scroll tradition. And here again, we have a little bit of documentary evidence in Cave 2 
1901, where we see an image of a monk holding a scroll. And next to it, I've put an image of a scroll that I've spent a lot of time working on here from Cave 17. So this is Pelio Chinois 2197, now housed in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, or the BNF. This is an example of a deluxe Buddhist hand scroll with intact bamboo roller, tie, and frontispiece. I would date this object quite late, which is a bit different than what the original Pelio catalogers did, uh, to the final decades of the 10th century based on certain codicological evidence that we could discuss later, if you like. The scroll is comprised of 16 sheets measuring 14 and a half to 15 and a half by 645 centimeters long when unrolled, so it's a very long scroll. On the back of the frontispiece, which is constructed of a different type of paper than the rest of the roll, is an unexplained grid, grid design in red. So I don't know if you can see that. The recto appears to represent a liturgical compendium and includes 10 individual Dharani sutras or excerpta that have been marked up presumably by a reader or reciter of the text. On the right we see the roll and on the left we see a detail of the construction of the frontispiece, the edges reinforced with a strip of bamboo and there is a cord of various colored silks used to fasten, to fasten it. And you can also see some of the additional marks, reading marks, highlighter marks, ornamentation that's been added in red ink or vermilion. Here you can see several interesting features of the manuscript, including the presence of, of again, several red lectional signs used to highlight portions of the text, suggesting perhaps the liturgical function of the manuscript. You can also see two lines of corrected text where strips from a different stock of paper were glued on top uh, of what was presumably uh, mistaken characters to create a new writing surface to add the correct text. So I've highlighted one of the um, corrections and there's another on the bottom register. So from the scroll type, we now turn to the new book format to Dun Huang, beginning with the Poti. The Poti is a ubiquitous Buddhist book format derived from the Indian Pushtaka, the Sanskrit term for the palm leaf book. This book form is often referred to by the Hindi term Poti, at least I think that's what, where this term comes from, and I'd be curious to hear if anyone has another opinion about that. This Indian format consists of sheets of dried palm leaf cut into rectangular shaped pages stacked one on top of the other. The pages were bound by string that passed through holes going through the middle of the document. Sometimes one hole, sometimes two. All the pages would then be sandwiched together between wooden boards that not only helped keep the pages together but also protected the document from damage. So in a recent essay, Stefan Baums, and his name is going to come up quite a lot, suggests that the early extant palm leaf manuscripts in, in the Poti format were found in the northwest of the subcontinent and on the Silk Roads, quote, far away from the South Indian cradle of this format in manuscript deposits dating back approximately to the 3rd century CE. So I'm assuming he's talking about some of the finds I'm about to show you. He further states that it is these discoveries that provide insights into the general ad uh, adoption of the Poti format and the emergence of a new pan-Buddhist textuality and that, the grant and, um, and that they grant at least an indirect glimpse into the mainland Indian manuscript tradition that preceded it. So here I'm going to show you a number of slides of different Poti traditions uh, to underscore the emergence and spread of this format in Buddhist India and Central Asia. Uh, and eventually into Dunhuang. So this is um, a birch bark poti from Bamiyan dating to the 6th or 7th centuries um, and it contains a copy of the Vajracharika Prajnaparamita. Um, you can see some basic layouts, the rectangular format, the hole pierced for string, um, and the basic page layout. And we're going to see this format replicated over and over and over again across Central Asia. Here is an example of a poti, of a, a copy of a Vinaya text on a birch bark manuscript from Gilgit, likely also 6th or 7th century. And what I'd like to call your attention here 
two here is not, again, just the basic format and layout, but the ornamentation that's found on this early Buddhist manuscript. So already by the time of Bamiyan and Gilgit, we have, and I will make a stronger argument that already by the time of the Gandharan birch bark manuscripts, we already have a kind of sophisticated scribal slash scholastic tradition evident on the earliest Buddhist manuscripts. So here is just a random assemblage of Poti in the British Library Junhuang collection, and these are all from that Southern Silk Road site I pointed out earlier called Nia. And again, if we just look at the catalog, which I don't know if I can read, um, they are made uh, from ink and on leather, ink on paper, um, ink on wood. So there's a variety of formats and materials that are being, uh, sorry, there's a variety of materials being used to replicate the same basic format. We also have Tokarian poti, and of, of course we have the Tibetan poti or pecha. And we also have illuminated Manichaean poti books, like this example that Shoshana Gulashi has written so wonderfully about in her magisterial medieval Manichaean book art, uh, published in 2005. So this is a religious anthology in the Uyghur language, likely dating to the first quarter of the 10th century. And again, you can see the replication of the basic format. You can see the hole for stringing the text together. And in fact, some of the descriptions that Baum, Baums gives of the copper plates from India, where you have a hole like this in this shape, uh, held together by rings, it looks very similar. I want to just sort of stay on this Manichaean book tradition for a second. In part because they're such impressive specimens and in part because I had the chance to see them with some of the people from the Tong Center here last summer. So covers were an important but little documented part of Turfan Manichaean book culture. And here we see a color illustration of a deity and the elect in the bottom register, the deity on the top. But what's really interesting in terms of book history about this image that Gulashi published is the bookcase sitting on the desk. So here we have the deity sort of leaning over uh, what appears to be a leather bookcase, and Gulashi makes the com a kind of comparison with the image of a leather wrapper from the Islamic tradition. So how all of these um, traditions got to Turfan in the 10th century is a wonderful story. And here's just an image of what we saw last summer. Um, this Manichaean poti now lives in Dalam outside of Berlin, uh, in, the, in the Humboldt Forum collection, I guess is how you would say it. Um, and they're just extraordinary. So returning to Buddhist poti, here we have a Tibetan tantric poti, ITJ331. This is a loose, loose leaf paper poti, which developed from Indian palm leaf manuscripts. The Tibetan script, a calligraphic form, popular in 10th century Dunhuang, is read from left to right. Notes have been added between the lines of text in smaller writing, and analysis of both hands suggests that they were written by the same scribe. So if you think about page layouts and what all is going on, intellectually speaking, materially speaking, on individual poti, it gets quite exciting. It's going to get more exciting now. And I show you a local variation of this Indian poti format in the form of a Chinese poti. So this is a loose leaf uh, poti measuring um, about 34 by 8 centimeters. It's 131 numbered folios with rounded corners, and that's a very distinctive feature of the Chinese poti. Each folio is pierced for string, and the stacked folios are decorated with flaming jewel motifs. So on either side of the stack, you get this wonderful flaming jewel design. Relatively rare, we know a little bit about Chinese poti. Uh, they were wider than the original Indian versions. Uh, many Chinese poti had only one hole for string uh, to pass through. 
um, although there's very little evidence that there ever were strings attached to these. Um, and the loose leaf Pody format was more user friendly than the scroll for doing certain kinds of thinking and reading and possibly writing. Uh, and paper made it an even more accessible format. Colin Chinnery, in his IDP International Dunhuang Project essay, which still remains one of the best discussions of Dunhuang bookbinding, states that by the time the first Buddhist Poti books entered China in the third and fourth centuries, paper had already been in general use for two to three hundred years, and it was to take at least another three hundred years for the Chinese to make their own poti. So I don't know what he's basing that on, but my guess is, like those iconographical um, images we saw of early Buddhist book use, that there are textual references in the Taisho canon and other transmitted Buddhist canons that talk about the introduction of the poti form in, in Chinese Buddhist circles. The issue of paper is really a fascinating and important one for the study of cent uh, Central Asian codicology and of broader patterns of cultural exchange along the Silk Roads. The earlier paper manuscripts from Dunhuang books um, are often made of paper produced in central China and imported into Dunhuang. Situated at the edge of two great deserts, the Gobi and the Taklamakan, Dunhuang had a very dry climate and as a result could not sustain the plant life needed for much paper production. However, as Chinnery points out, from the 8th century onwards, as the Tang Dynasty was in decline, the area surrounding Dunhuang was subject to much unrest, and as a result, contact with Central Asia, with Central China, suffered considerably. This meant that there was no longer an abundant supply of paper, and consequently, paper had to be produced locally. Uh, compared with the paper made in central China, local Dunhuang paper was thick and coarse, making it more stiff and reliant to wear. Now, I personally have never completely bought this whole paper shortage theory, um, so it would be an interesting thing to talk about, scarcity and local production versus, versus importation, um, but it's sort of one of these big questions that's swirling in the air of Dunhuang paper studies, if there is such a thing. Uh, and I'll also just point out here on the um, right is an image of uh, two of the folios so you can see how the page has been ruled. So there's a margin uh, and there are guidelines that have been laid down. And it is very likely that the paper was cut and that the holes were pierced prior to the addition of the text. And there's some evidence for that. So you can see where they've maneuvered, the scribe has maneuvered around um, the, the guidelines and where they've maneuvered around the, um, the string hole in certain folios. So Chinese, uh, this is a Paleo Shimwa 3920 and it's a Chinese esoteric Buddhist ritual compendium of 12 textual items. This is a loose leaf poti. Uh, comprised of 219 oblong folios pierced for string and gathered by what I think is a modern tie. I don't think that's a historical tie. The folios are numbered on the upper right hand from 4 to, to 221. Folios 1 to 3 are missing and 2 folios are numbered 32. And that was a fun day to figure all that out. So here you see the stacked folios. And here you see a detail of some of the lectional signs and stamps that were added in a red ink to highlight different sections of the text and to mark the start and end of different texts. So turning to the concertina format, we can say a few things. Concertina binding appears to be a synthesis of traditional book forms of both China and India. One way of conceiving of the concertina, which is also called the accordion book, is as a folded scroll. The format also shares similarities uh, with the Chinese poti format based on size and shape. Some Dunhuang concertinas had holes pierced through uh, the pages in the style of the Indian poti, but these holes, again, did not appear to perform any, or they certainly could not have performed any practical function as the panels on a concertina are literally glued together. Uh, and again, it is curious that most string holes in Chinese poti uh, show no signs of use whatsoever. So it, it just appears to have been an ornamental feature of this book format. 
manuscript, uh, we have manuscript and print concertinas, both of which survive at Dunhuang, uh, and underscore the strong relationship between the form and function of early Buddhist books. So here I'll call your attention to PC3835, which is also in Paris. So this is a small concertina. Uh, you can see it's about the size of my pencil. Uh, and it's just a sort of treasure trove for thinking about book production, book production at Dunhuang and the kinds of local innovations and personalizations that were made to individual books. So given its size and its format, so that you could flip through it, this looks to have been uh, made by the individual who owned it and used it, and in fact, he left some kind of cryptic book curse on the front. Uh, Imre Galambos and I have found about, I don't know, a dozen of these scattered throughout the Dunhuang collections, and they basically say something like, this doesn't necessarily say it, but uh, it, it names someone and says, don't touch my book. <laughs> okay. But once we cracked that code, it was quite exciting. So here on the right you can see um, an insert made from recycled paper that was added to a page where text had been dropped. So this is just one of the many uh, flaps or fold inserts that you can find on this manuscript. So working with it uh, in Paris, I unfolded the whole thing, but only so much could be unfolded at a certain time. It's quite long. Um, but you can see that it's what we might call a compendia. Uh, or a composite manuscript, so it contains something like, I forget what I counted, I don't know, 30, 40 different items on the manuscript, some with illustrations, many of which are marked up, again, using red highlighters or lectional signs, um, and it spans in content from talis a manual of talisman, a, a Taoist recipe book, um, uh, some of what I argue are some of the only known Chinese um, traditions of doing Mahayoga sadhana practice. That's part of the manuscript. Uh, and you can see as you unfold it just how complicated it gets. I'm not sure that you can tell from this, but you have the, the main concertina and there's all these flaps so you can unfold it. So this really does show you something about uh, the paper that was available and these are all recycled sheets that were used to create these flaps and inserts. So you really kind of get a sense of the, the sort of handmade world that PC3835 came out of. And given the variety of texts found on the manuscript, you can really get a sense of this being a personal library or an archive used by the individual whose name appears two different times on the manuscript. So these are the meditation or visualization manuals I just mentioned. These are Chinese texts that appear to have their closest um, relation to a set of Tibetan sadhana texts that also circulated at Dunhuang. But you can see the kind of incredible markup that's been done on them. So here's a detail. So you have these five seed syllables here on the right, and then you have lines, again, in that red or vermilion ink, connecting them to the individual visualization instructions for each syllable. So you just see lots of this stuff on manuscripts like this uh, handmade concertina. I've traced those texts across several manuscripts at Dunhuang, and what's really interesting is that they're all laid out on the page in the same way, regardless of the format. So we have a concertina, so we have the scroll, and we have poti texts, and they retain the the mise en page of the text. So that's portable. And it can be placed on any, on any writing surface. So that's quite exciting. And again, every copy of those texts has the same set of lectional signs or highlighter marks. And so this is an extremely useful tool, tracing those signs and symbols across manuscripts for dating when we have copies of texts that have dated colophons and book curses like these do. I'm not sure. Okay. So concertinas did not only come in handwritten form. At Dunhuang we have a number of printed, oh, we have a printed book dating from the mid-10th century. I think there's actually two printed concertinas at Dunhuang. This is Peleo Xinhua 
1.5 in Paris. Uh, renowned for its vast repository of manuscripts, the Dunhuang Library Cave contained a greater volume of printed materials than is commonly represented. And while enigmatic, these surviving artifacts provide evidence of their reception from close to the beginning of the era of mass printing in East Asia. Covered from the site are 30-odd Buddhist illustrated prints commissioned in 947 and 949 and 950 uh, by the ruler of Dunhuang, Cao Yuanzhong, roughly one-third of which show signs, show signs of intentional modification or recycling now scattered across a global network of museums and libraries. I'm going to show you some samples. So first, this is a printed colophon. It contains a copy of the Diamond Sutra, dated to 949-950. The colophon includes the name of both the sponsor of the book, again, Cao Yuanzhong, ruler of the Dunhuang region, uh, and the printmaker, Lei Yanmei, the same carver identified in the next set of prints that I'm going to show you. So we don't have a lot of good evidence. Um, for workshops or atelier in the region, but we have a, you know, a huge uh, output of materials. So this is sort of you know, rare and valuable evidence for who these carvers and sponsors were. So this ruler, Cao Yuanzhong, also commissioned a set of prints. This is one of two, and this is uh, an image of Avalokiteshvara, with a kind of extended colophon on the bottom. This was commissioned on 4 August 947 and carved again by the same printmaker uh, as the Diamond Sutra um, printed book. Uh, and this print is one of roughly 20 extant copies that I've tracked down, preserved at Dunhuang in various states of repair and creative reuse. And this happens to be in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, where I live, and it's the only <laughs> Dunhuang document in Canada. So here is a set of the Tao Avalokiteshvara prints that I've tracked down. So again, you can see how uh, the various states that they exist in, and many of them have been cut up and reassembled or painted or um, have borders added to them. And so after their original production, after the original print run, these prints stayed in circulation somehow uh, and found reuse. So here's just one example of a modified cell print with the border made of recycled paper. And so this recycling of paper is a really great thing for dating manuscripts because they're often official documents that have been recycled. And they're often dated and or have the name of local officials, which you can track down. So there's all sorts of ways that these recycled materials are quite helpful, historically speaking. So this is an example of a cell print that's been painted and had a border attached. Um, uh, and it has a handwritten dedication added here on the left. So this is quite uh, exciting to find. And in addition to having a uh, refashioned and bordered print that was then painted, uh, we also see evidence that it was hung up or pinned through these pinholes that we see across uh, the top and bottom borders. And so this is very common in that set of roughly 20 recycled prints that I've tracked down. And this is the two Tsao prints, Avalokiteshvara and Vaishravana, that have had paper tabs added for hanging. So again, further evidence of the use or the afterlives and use of these Tsao prints, which almost certainly were commissioned and printed by Tsao for some reason serving his office. And in another paper I've got coming out, these are some of the portable paintings also recovered from Dunhuang that use similar manners for hanging, so the addition of similar types of tabs. And so this is a very interesting way of approaching materials made of different, uh, of objects made of different materials to which similar technologies are applied for devotional purposes and what have you. So this is quite an exciting find, these paper uh, hanging paper banners. So going back to uh, the concertina, we find this amazing bilingual concertina S5603, which is currently in the British Library. 
And again, I've recently co-authored a piece with Berkeley's very own, Megan Howard, on this manuscript, where we try to situate it based on its Chinese and Tibetan contents uh, to the early 9th century translation team headed by the well-known Sino-Tibetan translator Wu Fachang, also known by the Tibetan name uh, Go Chudru, that was based near Dunhuang. This manuscript contains Yuan Hui's lost commentary. There was some record of it, but it's only found at Dunhuang. Uh, his lost commentary to the Lankavatara Sutra with Tibetan annotations, likely a translation crib used by Fa Chang or those in his circle. The manuscript contains two recensions of the Lankavatara Sutra, one embedded in the Chinese commentary inscribed on the panels from top to bottom, right to left in Chinese, uh, and the other, a separate Tibetan recension of the Lanka that's been used to annotate the embedded Chinese version of the text, again, likely for the purposes of producing a Tibetan translation of Yuan Hui's commentary. So I know that you can't see them, but uh, here we have the text oriented horizontally in line with the Tibetan sutra passages, so we've taken the concertina and rotated it to now read the Tibetan. Um, uh, the Tibetan sutra passages that run from left to right between the columns of Chinese. Faint Tibet Tibetan index letters placed in the spaces next to the red glyphs mark each Tibetan sutra passage. So this is a fascinating example of the ways in which the books preserved at Dunhuang inform us about Buddhist scribal as well as scholastic practices, with scholastic practices here referring to everything from pedagogy to translation to commentary writing. Indeed, multilingual manuscripts like this concertina raise questions about cultural contact within structured environments of teaching and learning, especially with regard to the role of translation, both literal and metaphorical. They also offer uh, evidence regarding the historical relationship of scholarly and vernacular languages and discourses, or languages and discourses that existed side by side, as we see here. Here, patterns of a shared Buddhist scribal practice emerge, and possibly reading cultures and scholastic cultures, and also, as I showed on previous manuscripts, ritual cultures. They sometimes collide on manuscripts. Now finally, on to our last book format, the codex, or what are also called stitch books um, or thread-bound books. We see that a codex is a book that consists of one or more choirs or gatherings, also called signatures, and that the choirs in turn comprise several bifolia stacked together and folded in half, then sewn together in the middle. And here I'm relying on the work of Imre Galambos, who's published a wonderful book in 2020 on Dunhuang books. There are roughly 400 extant thread-bound books at Dunhuang, constituting a significant subsection of the overall collection. I mean, you might not think that if we're counting the manuscripts of 50 plus thousand, but I'm telling you 400 of a type is quite significant. Jean-Pierre Dresch has argued that the appearance of the codex in the, Sinop the Sinophone world is indebted to contact with Western manuscript cultures, uh, which may have been brought, to, brought by Occidental traditions, uh, as he calls them, like Manichaeism. There certainly seems to be an exchange happening on many levels and moving in many directions, but we can't draw any direct lines. This was a, a very new method of putting books together for the Chinese, making it unique in the history of Chinese book binding. One of the most striking uh, aspects of the Dunhuang Codices is the fact that they appeared uh, at such an early date. The colophons on some of the books tell us that they were copied and bound during the Tang Dynasty, uh, some six centuries before the emergence of the mature thread binding books of the Ming Dynasty. It's also surprising uh, to note that variety that the variety of stitching techniques already being applied uh, at Dunhuang. So I'm just going to take you through a little tour of stitch books. So here we have the simplest uh, binding technique called the single stitch binding, which is just a single thread binding all the folios together in the upper corner. So this is an undated booklet measuring um, 10 by 17 and a half centimeters. So it's small. Uh, and it contains chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra, and as you can see, it's been illustrated. Uh, and some of the illustrations have not been colored in, and others have, so it's an interesting uh, critical study. Another early book binding technique we see at Dunhuang is stab stitching. Uh, so this is an undated uh, book, uh, ink on paper. Um, 
which utilizes this technique. And again, drawing on Chinnery's article, we know a few things about stab stitching at Dunhuang based on this one manuscript, S5646, in the British Library. So here you see an illustration which outlines the process. So the pages are folded and brought together into gatherings. The unstitched gatherings were then piled together. A cover was placed around the back of the book, and then three holes were pierced through the book near the spine. Two strings were used to pass through the three holes and bind the book at the spine. Uh, we also have books made of multiple gatherings or choirs, consisting of two or more sheets of paper joined together um, with thread at the fold. So again, you can see an illustration of this. The spines of each of the gatherings are sewn together. All the spines of the gatherings are brought together to form the spine of the book. This is very uh, simple, um, and yet does represent a sort of leap forward from the single stitch or the stab stitching techniques. So here we have S5433 in the British Library, where six gatherings were sewn together in the middle to form an empty book of 24 folios. And this is, again, a kind of interesting point. Uh, the red thread that is used to bind them together is visible. So what is this thread? Who had access to it? Those are good questions. And the text would have been inscribed after the book was made, or so we think. And so that's an interesting question to ask about the process by which these books were manufactured. So would a private individual make the book from start to finish? Would they buy a prefab uh, stitch book and then inscribe it themselves or at home or have it uh, inscribed by a professional scribe? These are the kinds of questions that we can ask by looking carefully at the extant samples. What's interesting that we see is that uh, one kind of common theme that we see on these small portable stitch booklets is that they often contain what we call extra canonical or apocryphal Chinese Buddhist materials. These are not canonical texts, or if they are, like the previous example, which was 25, chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra, these are what we might call like text or sections of the text that are in kind of common circulation that would have had a kind of liturgical or pedagogical function or didactic function, so they would have been sort of personal books that one would carry with them. Uh, in addition to the Poti, Concertina, and Codex at Dunhuang, we see a bunch of hybrid formats like this, my absolute favorite manuscript at Dunhuang, Peleo Shinwa 3913. I have translated the entirety of this text. Um, and this stitch booklet uh, has the dimensions of a typical concertina and a Chinese Poti format, but you can see that it's actually a multi-gathered uh, codex. So they have mimicked the the dimensions of the poti and the concertina, um, and yet it is produced through the uh, threading of several different gatherings. So here's just two different views of the book binding and then what the stacked folios look like on the other side of the production. And here again we have um, you can see a detail of the binding, which is now sadly falling apart. I don't know if I'll ever see it again. Um, but we also see another book curse here. And the name that I've highlighted in this square uh, is a figure who I can trace very reliable to two years. So his name and two dates appear on about a dozen different Dunhuang manuscripts dating to the year 978 and 980. So this is extremely helpful for tracking texts. Uh, it's interesting for thinking about the development of the book format and the local Buddhist community. This is another stitched book, uh, PC3861 in Paris. Uh, so you can see the dimensions are quite different than the Poti format, or the hybrid uh, Poti format. Uh, this is the front and back cover. This is also a uh, light concertina S5603 that I showed earlier, a multilingual book, and this is truly multilingual. So we have at least three languages represented on the text, uh, Cotonese, Tibetan, and Chinese. And we have several sections where the Chinese and Tibetan are glossing each other. So they're not direct translations, but uh, glosses are adding different types of information in one or the other languages annotating the text. So here the booklet, like with the bilingual concertina, you have to rotate it to read the different texts. So here we have it with the Tibetan orientation, and then you would rotate it this way um, to make sense or to read or decipher the Chinese text. 
And again, look at the size. You see my pencil. This is fairly small. It's a little bit of an irregular shape. Um, but so it raises a host of questions about who would have made such a, such a text, who would have inscribed it and carried it. Um, all those good questions. So in a recent issue of the Art Bulletin, Finbar, Barry Flood, and Beata Frick discuss the sorts of connectivity to which material culture attests and call attention, um, and call attention to the methodological problem of what they call evidential gaps, they state. The reconstruction of so many historical moments of connectivity rests on major gaps in knowledge and information that we will never be able to fill. The challenge is how and how actively we, we address the resulting dead ends and how we move on or move beyond them. This means that we have to make very conscious methodological choices about how we legitimize ourselves as art historians or as historians of material culture and visual culture, and here I would add social historians and textualists to the mix. So given these evidentiary gaps, where does the study of the book in the Silk Roads currently stand? While I can't speak for the multiple subfields that this phrase implicates, it's clear that we're now at a new crossroads when it comes to the study of Buddhist and Central Asian manuscript traditions. With respect to the Dunhuang sample specifically, it is now clear that they were born of sophisticated manuscript cultures that combined indigenous Chinese writing technologies with those adopted from Indian and Central Asian or maybe even Tibetan models and display a rich assemblage of intellectual and codicological practices some with very long and distant histories of use. When lined up together and explored both for their format and knowledge and knowledge systems that they embody, the study of Dunhuang's books marks a, a bold step in exploring the nature of the continuities as well as the disjunctions of early Buddhist book history. But now we also need to frame our history writing of trans-regional connectivity across Eurasia wisely, because in some real sense, we all know that we have all always been global, and there's always uh, been substantial contact between cultures and regions. Indeed, as the historian Alan Strathern has put it, quote, the celebration of connectedness in global history writing risks analytic banality, unless we are also able to make visible temporal and geographic variations in its extent, end quote. So one clear challenge that lies ahead um, uh, for codicologists and textualists alike is how we will embrace the methodologies of global historical studies and collaboration and see where these methods take us. So to call, uh, the call to do more collaborative work is echoed in some of the most impressive studies of medieval Western or Middle Eastern manuscript cultures to emerge in the past couple of decades. And much of this work consciously considers Dunhuang and Eastern Central Asian manuscript cultures. Manuscript, yeah, manuscript cultures. Take, for example, the work of scholars like Marina Rustow, a specialist of the Cairo Geneza, and a really good conversation partner, uh, and its manuscript binds. Or, or historian Natalie Rothman, who works on Ottoman archives. It's fascinating to consider what scholars like Rustow and Rothman both of whom have developed, again, that deep intuition about the nature of the archives they study, see and don't see in collections like that of Dunhuang. Might such a directly comparative approach, Cairo Ganesa and Dunhuang, propel the field forward? Oh, uh, I think it might. Uh, it certainly has propelled my own work forward and that of a few others. Uh, and this extends also to points along what we might call the eastern stretches of the old Silk Roads, including Japan, and including even modern Japan. We know that the earliest surviving Buddhist prints were recovered from Korea and Japan, and the scribal practices documented by scholars working in those regions have uncovered remarkably similar scribal, scholastic, and ritual traditions both in the past and in the present. And I'll just take one more second here to show you some of this stuff. So one of the most exciting books I've read is uh, a Buddhist studies uh, Kuroda book by uh, Michaela Mross, where she documents contemporary Japanese um, chanting manuals. And many of the marks uh, and the ornamentation and the notations that she documents in these, this long Japanese manuscript tradition seem to have precursors or parallels or some kinds of distant relatives in the Dunhuang manuscripts, like 
this sample hand taken from that long and diverse concertina I showed you earlier uh, unfolded. Um, so you can see that we have um, a hand diagram um, which has got various explanations of the different power points or eyes that appear on the palms uh, linked together with these very sort of ornate red ink lines which might actually be musical notations. And so this is a system that's yet to be deciphered um, and I'm working with a scholar, um, Marta Hansen, on this stuff right now, so it's very interesting. So the comparison with Japan has certainly helped in this case. I also just want to call our attention back to Gandhara. Uh, and again, why the early Gandhara material is so exciting is not just because it per preserves the earliest extant Buddhist writing, but because it preserves other traditions as well. And here you can see the scribal, or again, scholastic tradition that is literally marked on the manuscript in the form of um, these embellishments, punctuation, and different kinds of additional reading marks. So these practices are as old as Buddhist writing. So it's not as if Buddhist writing was around for a long time and then they adopted these methods, that they were sort of brought in at the same time. So this is quite exciting. So this question about scribal and scholastic relationship is quite fascinating. And we see this all over Dunhuang. So one of the big questions about these manuscripts, which to me look a lot like what I call the working papers of a local Buddhist institution. So diagrams, notebooks, lecture notes, commentaries that have been annotated and things like that. So amongst these working papers, what kinds of scribal slash scholastic traditions do we see? Well, here is a copy of an exegetical outline prepared in advance of Fa Chang, that monk tra translator I mentioned earlier. Uh, his lectures on the Yogacara Bhumi, annotated in Chinese, with lectional signs marking four levels in the outline. And Stefan Baums has found a very similar um, system in some of the Gandharan and Bamian manuscripts that he's worked on. So again, this is quite an old tr tradition of marking up texts in different languages, in different periods, and on different media. And here we see some uh, medieval Tibetan Buddhist scribal slash scholastic cultures. So this is an annotated copy, and this is from Megan Howard's work again. The Pratityat Samuppada Hridaya in Tibetan configured with boxes that delineate the relationship between the root text, which if you can see in the upper left corner is red, um, between the root text and the glosses. Uh, and the auto-commentary, which appears on this manuscript, which itself is quite fascinating, um, appears in black, so in contrast to the red root text. We also see diagrams or schematic drawings like this one at Dunhuang, which likely dates to the 8th century. And uh, I've tried to connect this to the circle of a figure known at Dunhuang named Tang Kuang. It may have been produced by him or those in his circle. Um, and it's a table of the five-stage five division of the Yogacar path uh, presented in the Chang Wei Shen Lun. So these kinds of didactic or um, explanatory devices are at Dunhuang, and this is the kind of stuff that I've spent time sort of digging out and sort of thinking with uh, over the past few years. And the last thing, we see other kinds of preparatory materials and devices. In this case, we see a sketchbook which illustrates some of the Chinese esoteric Buddhist rituals that I work with um, on this three, these three loose leaf sheets that are cataloged in Paris. Uh, so we see all kinds, again, like these are the working papers or um, the sort of what you might call the informal canon or the working canon of Dunhuang Buddhists. So finally, in conclusion, I also think that the study of the Book in the Silk Roads would benefit from more time spent thinking about the art and craft of all the book traditions encompassed by that term. As an avid weaver myself, I've spent many happy Sunday afternoons making loops and tying off knots as part of a weaving collective. Inevitably, someone brings up just how connected we are to the past in those moments uh, and how often overlooked, how often overlooked social and institutional realities like gender, embodiment, and materiality flow naturally from the study of craft practices. 
Women, for instance, have for centuries sat spinning yarn and fabricating textiles using devices fashioned from wood. Book technicians have prepared, have been preparing and stringing leaves and other plant materials together for millennia. And artisans of all stripes have been devising tools and mixing pigments to conjure our collective stories for even longer than that. So do all these old craft technologies <coughs> uh, belong to the history of the book? Again, I think they do, and so for my part, I will continue looking for traces in ink and color on paper and print and between the covers of books to study long lost traditions along the old book routes uh, and along the old silk routes, uh, for it is in these traces that the workaday world of, Buddhist, of the Buddhist past can be found. Uh, and it is this medieval workaday world that shines so brightly and speaks so loudly in our general sources, theorizes history from the bottom up. The study of the Buddhist book and Silk Roads is one method of documenting the rich details of the Buddhist past. And although Silk Road studies as an interdisciplinary field has matured, I hope we never lose our romance with these old books. Thank you so much.